So we're in this series called Love for No Reason. And I heard a story the other day about a couple who had just finished having dinner. And the wife was feeling insecure, as she was wont to do. And so she was asking her husband again to tell her how much he loved her. She said, how much do you love me? And he said, oh, honey, how can I make it clear to you how much I love you? I, I love you so much. If, if, if you were about to be in a car accident, if a truck was about to run over you, I would stop that truck and I would, I would get you out of the way and I would lay down myself and receive the injury on your behalf just to show you how much I love you. And he said, I love you so much that if you were ever sick, I would, I would give you my kidney or my liver or, or my heart. I would give you my heart just to show you how much I love you. How can I show you how much I love you, honey? And she thought about it for a moment. And she said, well, you could start by doing the dishes. <laughs> so we are continuing our series on love for no reason, which is not about loving somebody because they do the dishes or they give you an organ. It's about being in that pure place of love that is beyond outer circumstance. You see, love for no reason is, is a pure inner state of being that is beyond anything in the outer, beyond location or circumstance or the person in your life, it is beyond all of that. And we're basing our series on this book by Marcy Shimoff called Love for No Reason. This is her second New York Times best-selling book. And Marcy says that there are four states of love that range from no love, which is this state of such grief, such sadness, that your heart is shut down and you cannot either give or receive love to what she calls love for bad reason. And love for bad reason is when we love in order to what we think will complete ourselves. We feel so, so unworthy ourselves that we love someone else in order to somehow make ourselves feel more worthy. It's a codependent kind of love. It is, is the basis often of addictions, this kind of love for bad reason. Then she says there's love for good reason. And this is where most of us hang out most of the time. Love for good reason is when I say, I love you because you're so kind and you're so considerate and because you make a great peach cobbler. You know, this is, this is love for good reason, right? This is, this is the love where we're really noticing and appreciating the people in our lives. But then there is this love for no reason that's not conditional upon anything. You might call it unconditional love. It's a state of being that you carry with you no matter what circumstance you're in. And so over the next five weeks, our, our aim is to live more in a place of love for no reason. That is what our goal is. And we're going to be using this book as our guidebook. And one of the things that Shimoff does is to create a framework, if you will, to help us remember all the many steps that we might take to experience love for no reason. And she uses the seven energy centers of the body, the seven chakras, what many spiritual traditions call them. And there are seven energy centers in the body. And, and it makes sense to study them as a part of love for no reason because love itself is an energy, right? So these seven energy centers um, align pretty much vertically from the base of our spine all the way to the top of our head. And each week we're going to be talking about a couple of them and how it is that by understanding those energy centers better and more thoroughly, we can begin to embody this love for no reason. So the first energy center we're going to talk about is what's called the first chakra. And it's at the base of the spine. This particular chakra is known as the chakra of safety and security. And she calls it actually the doorway of safety. Sometimes it's called the root chakra. And it's all about feeling emotionally and physically safe. And, and you'll remember that Abraham Maslow created his hierarchy of needs, right? And what was at the bottom, what was the most important level of that of that hierarchy of needs, and that was safety, feeling secure, feeling safe in life. And he said that if you don't have that, that, that safety, then you can't hope to accomplish anything else in your life. You've got to have the safety first. So that's where we're starting with this series. Dr. John Dulyard 
told Shimoff that because modern day stress levels trigger the fight or flight response so often, we're actually building bodies of fear. Worries don't just disappear into thin air after we think them. They leave a toxic trail of neurochemicals like cortisol and, and norepinephrine that get stored in our bodies. So what he's saying is that, that our worry, worries and fears that we allow to perpetuate within ourselves actually change the chemical makeup of our bodies. So this first chakra we're going to call the doorway to safety. And there are two keys that Shimoff says will help you open this doorway of safety or really be focused on this chakra that is at the base of your spine. And the first key, she says, is to get grounded, to be grounded. And, and you know, it's a funny thing about unity and about people who are really on the spiritual path. So often, we're so darn spiritually good that we're no earthly good for anyone. Have you ever heard that said? Because we dwell sometimes at, at such a level that we're not really living in the world. We're not really able to negotiate the world. So getting grounded means that you're in the world. It means that you're in your body. And the most important way to get grounded is just to feel your feet on the ground, to take your shoes off. You're welcome to do that anytime, as Chuck Romero knows, because he's usually got his off right here in the front row. And anybody that wants to take their shoes off today, feel free to do that. And one of the reasons that this helps to ground you is that there's actually energy centers in the bottoms of your feet as well. So when you are walking barefoot, you are feeling the ground. When you are barefoot on the earth, I know it's a little chilly to do that today, but when you go outdoors and you walk barefoot, you feel the earth and the energy and the vibration of the earth, and it grounds you and it gets you in your body. Now, I'm a person whose feet are always cold, so I don't usually really like to go barefoot. Um, uh, but I'm going to try it for the moment here. I did it at the first service. It felt pretty good. My feet weren't cold at all, you know. So, so also, it can just mean simply feeling your feet on the floor. You know, if you're feeling scattered, anxious, irritable, like you can't get a hold of your thoughts or your next step, Feel your feet on the ground, whether they're in shoes or not. Just feel the ground. And part of getting grounded also is to breathe, just to breathe with intention. Because you say, well, I breathe all the time, Patricia. Of course you do. But when you intentionally breathe, when you pay attention to your breathing, it brings you back into your body. So if your fears and worries and anxieties are all out there and have you feeling very, very scattered, you breathe and you come right back to center. That's how it works. Let's talk about what good breathing is. You know, there are those who recommend that every morning before you get out of bed that you take five really deep, good breaths. So a good breath, a really deep, good breath, is where you breathe in and don't just fill your lungs, but you fill your diaphragm and your belly too so that your chest expands and so does your belly lift. That's a full, deep inhale. And then when you're at the top of the breath, you hold it for just an instant, whatever's comfortable for you, before then gently releasing. And as you release the breath, your chest contracts, your belly contracts, and at the bottom of the breath, you just rest for a moment. So you inhale deeply and you hold it, and you exhale deeply and you hold it. Let's do three of those right now. I'll guide you in the first one and let you just do the next three on your own. So you inhale deeply, expanding your diaphragm, your belly, filling your chest with air. You hold it for just a moment, and then you gently release. And you rest at the bottom of the breath. And as you're ready, breathe in again. And release when you're ready. And one more deep, good, full breath at your own pace. And when you've completed your three deep breaths, open your eyes so I'll know that you're finished. Can you feel the energy in the room now? grounded we are. We are grounded in God. We are grounded in our bodies. 
This is the place from which to act, the place from which to study and learn and grow, this place of groundedness. And you can do this anytime. So grounding is the first key to opening this doorway of safety, of feeling safe in the world. Whatever fear might be in front of you, feeling safe. The second key to open this doorway is to identify the emotional support around you. Identify the people who give emotional support to you, the people that you can call on if you're in a place of emergency, if you're in a place of need, the people that you can call on. And I'm just going to say that I'm noticing some people are putting on shawls and wraps, so I don't know if we can change the temperature, but if anybody hears me and wants to change it, just a skosh, we could do that. Just a little bit. I'm, I'm just paying attention here. So, because um, I'm grounded, I can see. I can see the wraps coming on. Okay, so the second key here is about um, asking yourself, who is your emotional support? You see, feeling safe is not just about physical safety. It's about emotional safety as well. And so if you happen to be in an emergency situation in the middle of the night tonight, who would you call? Who could you call? Now, some of you are saying, well, I wouldn't want to call anyone. I wouldn't want to disturb them. And I understand all about that. You may not think that there's a list of people who would come to, to be supportive of you. But if you really had to, who would you call? You see, just knowing that there are people that you can call, just knowing they're there helps to give you a sense of safety. I'll give you an example from my own life. I, remember I, was, a young, I was young, about 32 years old, when, when my father-in-law had just had his second heart surgery, and he was in the hospital. And I'd gone up to, to visit and sit with him. And it was a stressful time, as you can imagine, for the whole family. We, we didn't know if he was going to survive, and as it turned out, he did not. So there I sat with him. And after I'd been there for a while, I, I got up to leave. But when I did, I nearly blacked out. I felt myself starting to black out, and so I was able to sit in the chair before I collapsed on the floor. And it turned out that that day I just hadn't eaten properly. You know, I'd had, I think, a donut for breakfast, something sweet, you know, which is what you want when you're in stress. And I was very much in stress, as was my husband. And so immediately then, the doctors and the nurses, they came to start taking care of me. You know, and I felt so embarrassed because Jack was the one they needed to be tending to, not me. Here I was trying to do help and good, and instead I just distracted things, and one of the nurses says, so who are you going to call to take you home? Well, you need to know a little thing about Houston. I was in the Houston Medical Center. The Houston Medical Center is this wonderful conglomeration of way too many hospitals to count, and it is so confusing. Every time I went there, even when I ultimately became a minister later on and I would go to visit people, I got lost every single time. That won't surprise you, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyway... And my home was 45 minutes away, and that's without traffic, from where I was. We lived in Richmond, Texas, and here I was in downtown Houston. Who was I going to call that would give up the rest of their Sunday afternoon to come pick me up at the hospital, take me all the way out to Richmond, and then go back to their home? But it had to be done. I couldn't call Brian. He was at home with our children who were small at that time. I knew he was cooking dinner, and he was stressed to the max, too. And so I called my friend Patrick. Somehow I knew that Patrick would come. And he did. He and his partner, David, they were there in an instant and took me all the way home. And Patrick, I didn't fully understand at the time, but he was already in training to become a, a Reiki healer, so he did healing work on me the whole way home. This was before my own spiritual awakening had happened. But I knew I could call him, and here's what I learned about calling him. Sometimes you think, I could never call somebody. I couldn't let them know that I'm in need. But what I learned in that situation, and I've learned many times since, is that sometimes the greatest gift you can give somebody else is to let them support you. Isn't that true? Sometimes the greatest gift you can give somebody else. So, so part of identifying your own emotional support circle is letting people be there for you and knowing that they are there for you. And maybe you can't think of a soul right now. And if that's the case, I want you to know that we're here as a community for you. We are here, and we do have an emergency phone number that you can call. We are here as a support for you. So the, door, the key to this doorway of 
Safety is first getting grounded, no matter what the circumstances that you're facing. And then secondly, it is, ab- it is allowing yourself to know that there are others out there who support you. I want to tell you one of my favorite stories from the Bible. It's in the book of John, chapter 4, and it's the woman at the well. Jesus had been preaching, and he was traveling through Samaria. He went by the well in the middle of the day because it was hot and he was thirsty. And he happened to be traveling alone at this time. And he encountered at the well a woman who was filling her containers, her jars of water. Now, what you need to understand is that all of the other women had already been there that morning when it wasn't so hot. They'd come in the early morning when it was cool. All of the Jewish women had. But this woman was a Samaritan and she was not accepted by the other women. And so she had to come in the middle of the day when it was hot. And Jesus came up to her and spoke to her. And that in and of itself was pretty amazing because men did not speak to women that they did not know. Men did not speak to women who were strangers. That was not appropriate behavior of any sort. But he spoke to her. And as he spoke to her, he said, I have something to offer you. And it's living water. He said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, meaning the water in the well, will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that water, that living water. When I, when I read that story, what I envision is that Jesus is speaking about that infinite well of love, that infinite well of Christ's love that is in everyone. You know, we spoke our mission statement at the top of the service We are here to awaken and express the Christ nature in ourselves, our families, our community, and the world. You see, we know that there's a Christ nature in everyone, in each of you, and in every person regardless of their spiritual tradition. We call that God presence in them the Christ. They may call it something else, but we know that that God presence is in everyone. And there's an infinite well of this God presence, this God love in everyone. We know this is true. And so this living water that Jesus was offering her, he was saying to her, you've got the Christ in you and you are never alone. You've got the Christ in you always and you are never alone. This is an eternal well of love, an infinite well of love that the universe has placed within you. So in those moments where you're not feeling safe, you can always return to the God presence in you, which is your true essence. It's always there because even as you come to master Even as you come to master this living with love for no reason, it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. Even if I had been at an ascended level, it would not necessarily mean that my father-in-law would not have gone on to, to make his transition and die. But when you have this foundation of safety, then you know that you'll move through it. You know that you'll move through it. So that's the first chakra we want to talk about today. The second chakra or energy center that we want to talk about is sometimes called the Hara Center. It is located below your navel. It's kind of like between the navel and the base of your spine where the first chakra was. And and this is, this particular center is a center of vitality. She calls it, Marcy Shimoff in her book calls it, the, the doorway to vitality, to energy, to vibrancy, to physical and emotional well-being. Is there anybody here that doesn't want more energy, right? I mean, it is, it is, it is that part of us from when it is healthy and we're tuned in, then we have vibrant, vital energy. It's the center for pleasure, sexuality, and creativity, for more energy, zeal, and vitality in life. And so there are two keys as well for this particular center for how it is that you can activate it, if you will, and have it be a healthy center, the center of vitality. And the first is to nourish your body, to nourish your body, to care for your body as the temple that it is. And there's so many ways that you can nourish yourself. Um, Michelle Robin is one of the... um, 
as a church member here, and she is the owner of Your Wellness Connection. She's put up this little pamphlet called Engage a Wellness Lifestyle. And I love this little pamphlet because she talks about the most important things that you can do to have greater well-being in your life. And some of them are very simple. For instance, on her top 10 list is to go to bed at the same time as your partner, to have dinner with your partner once a week, to spend 10 minutes a day with your child. I mean, those sound simple, but when you make a commitment to them, they're really big. So as I flipped through there, I thought, you know, so how can I improve my overall wellness? How can I nurture my well-being, and in particular, my physical body? And one of the things that she recommends here is green smoothies. How many of you drink green smoothies? A number of you do, and the rest of you are going, ew. <laughs> so green smoothies actually taste great. Let me tell you what goes in green smoothies. You put in it the fruits of your choice, whatever fruit you like, and then you add something green. The green things that I like to add are either kale or spinach. And by the time you grind them up in a blender with the fruit, you, it tastes really yummy and wonderful. It's a great way to start the day. She says to make a commitment to doing that four to five times a week. Well, I've been doing that ever since I got this, this booklet online a while back. And I tell you, it starts the day off great. Now, the key is, I just got to tell you, the key is that you put in some handfuls of green stuff. We're not talking about just one or two little sprigs of spinach. <laughs> you put in some handfuls, but they grind all up. You know, my favorite is to put in part of a banana, part of an apple, and, you know, several strawberries, and then the rest of this green stuff in a cup of water. And, I, you know, you don't have to have a fancy blender to make this work. But it's not only filling, but it really starts my day off well. So that's one thing I'm doing to nurture myself. I've even started to think that it's the reason that my short-term memory seems a little bit better lately. But I, I can't remember for sure. <laughs> I just think it might be, right? So anyway, as I was... I was uh, as I was thinking yesterday about this wonderful booklet, I was guided to call Michelle and just ask her if she'd be willing to donate some to give away to you today. So sure enough, we got hold of a hundred of them. So there are a hundred of these, first come, first serve, out in the lobby. We gave some out at the first service. And again, just picking this up could be a way that you could choose to nourish yourself. What could you do to nourish and love your body a little bit more? What could you do to nourish and love your body a little bit more? One of the things she also mentions in there is about drinking water. You know, you're supposed to drink, um, you're, or it's recommended that you drink half your weight in ounces. So if you, if, you, if you weigh 140 pounds, that would be 70 ounces a day. Now, that's a lot of water. And I don't quite get in all the ounces I'm supposed to, but I'm drinking more water, you see, to be good to myself. I'm drinking more water than I used to. And I'll get up to where I need to get, or I'll lose weight so I can get there. I'm not sure which, old, you know. <laughs> eventually, I'll get to where I'm drinking enough, enough water. I once heard a person ask this question. If you had a million-dollar racehorse, would you keep it in the barn all day and feed it junk food? So aren't you more valuable than... A racehorse. How can you take care of yourself and value the preciousness that you are? So just ask yourself, what is one action step that you could take? And of course, we talked about breathing already, the importance of breath. That's also a part of nourishing your body. Okay, identify your circle of emotional support. Uh, oh, we've already, we already covered that. My notes got out of order here. I'm in the wrong one. Now, I want to say something different right now. I want to talk about feeling your feelings. That's the, second, that's the second way that you can help to activate this second chakra, which is located somewhere below your navel, this chakra of vitality. And it's to feel your feelings. But we don't want to feel our feelings, really. There's so many that are unpleasant. We would just as soon not feel them. We would just as soon ignore them and pretend that they're going to go away. And why do we want to do this? We want to do this because maybe sometimes the feelings don't make sense to us. You know, we think we shouldn't be feeling that. It's, it's not reasonable. But more often, it's that we're afraid to feel those feelings. We're afraid that if we feel them, it'll hurt. Well, yeah, feelings can hurt. But the thing to know about feelings is that they are messengers. Whatever your feelings are in your body, your body is this great big energy field. The feelings that you feel in your body are trying to tell you something. So ask them what they're trying to tell you. 
Over and over in my life, I've learned that the way out is the way through. In other words, the way to get the way to get out of these feelings that might be uncomfortable is to move through them, to move through them. And I know that in unity, sometimes we think, if I can just think a positive thought, the feeling will go away. And sometimes that does happen. But I recommend instead thinking positive thoughts and feeling the feelings. You see, not going into denial, allowing both to inform you. Yes, we can control what we think about and we can feel our feelings and then get the message that we need to get from those feelings. Janine Roth, who is the author of the bestseller book, Women, Food, and God, had been advised that she needed to feel her feelings in order to get well. And she was afraid to. She said, I thought that I would drown in sadness, be consumed with anger. I thought that keeping the feelings away was what was allowing me to function, and that in practicing inquiry, I'd be unable to cope. Have any of you ever been afraid that if you gave into the feelings, you would drown. She goes on to say, but it turns out that being with feelings is not the same as drowning in them. With awareness and presence, it's possible to be with what you believe will destroy you without being destroyed. It's possible to be with what you believe will destroy you without being destroyed. And then she says, it's the way into love. It's the way into love. So the two keys in order to have a more vital, vibrant, energetic sense of well-being are to feel your feelings and to nourish your body. And you can take action steps in that right away. You know, Shimoff says, when you deaden yourself to your feelings, you deaden yourself, period. You shut down your life force and by extension, your capacity to experience love. So what we're about in this series is is opening up to our life force, allowing it to flow freely. As we go through our fall face series, some of you are new to the fall face season, so I want to tell you that we have several things that support you. First of all, we have this book. Now, I know we ran out last week, and I'm so sorry about that, but we've ordered more. We've got more books in the bookstore. You can pick them up today. And and if you need to, just start with chapters four and five. That's the ones we're talking about today. Uh, Chapters one through three are great, but I summarized them pretty well for you. Next week, you can pick those up when you have time. So don't get overwhelmed. Just pick it up with chapter four and five. And notice that at the end of each chapter, there's a summary. And that can be helpful for you too. You can read that even before you read the rest of the chapter. Then what we, what we provide for you is the study guide. We've got more study guides in the lobby. Each week, there's a list of questions. In fact, go ahead, if you would, and open up your bulletin today. And you'll see that in your bulletin, on the inside right, just open it all the way up. And on the inside right, you'll see a list of inspirational readings and scripture. You'll see some questions and some exercises that you can engage in. You'll also see an affirmation. Every week we create an affirmation, a prayer statement for you. And the idea is that all of us will be praying this affirmation, keeping it present with us so that we're one big resonance field as we go through this. So let's speak our affirmation now together. The words are behind me on the screens. I say goodbye to worry and fear and dive deeply into the fullness of this moment and the richness of life the richness of life. We're diving in together. And there are some really good questions that you can choose to work on this week. You know, one of them says, number three says, do you ever stifle your feelings? And how would your life be different if you express them more freely? How would your life be different? So these are here to help you get the most out of this series that we are in. Albert Einstein once said that the most important decision that we will ever make, the most important decision you will ever make, is whether or not you believe you live in a friendly universe or a hostile universe. The most important choice you will ever make is whether or not you believe that you live in a friendly universe or a hostile universe. The interesting thing about that is that he says it's a choice. He says it's a choice. Now, I know that there are many facts out there in the world 
that would tell you that it's not a friendly universe. You only have to make it through a page or two of the newspaper. But this question goes beyond what's happening in the outer. This is a core belief. This is a core belief. I was reading about a man by the name of Reverend Gerard Panton, who is the founder of the Service Volunteered for All in Trinidad and Tobago. He gave a speech back in 2000. He noted about a particular group of Indians in Brazil called the Yaquana Indians. They do the coolest thing. They make sure that every infant born in their tribe has physical contact with the skin of another human being 24 hours a day for the first two years of their life. Now think about that. Think about a baby growing into toddlerhood always next to someone. What a safety that would provide for them. He says these children go up without the emptiness that we modern people spend our lives trying to heal or cope with. Citing Einstein's famous line, Panton adds that Yaquana children, because of close bodily contact, not only see the universe as friendly, but feel it to be loving. They have a bodily, visceral sense of an all-embracing love. Now, I know that you and I didn't grow up that way. Even if you had a great start in life, it's not in our culture to grow up with that kind of foundation. But as you work with these chakras, these first two chakras, it will build a sense of safety for you, physical and emotional safety. And the message for you to know is that God, that presence of God that is the essence of you, is like an unlimited well at the center of you. And it is always, always there. No matter what you face, no matter what news you've just heard, no matter what hurt or pain you have, the presence of God is always, always, always there. God bless you.